We've come to the third and final part of our series on the cross. Uh, so, so far we've looked at the past aspects, which is how Jesus' death dealt with our sin. And last week we looked at the present effects, and which are how Jesus' eternal spirit is with us to help us follow his example in our own lives. And now this week we'll discuss the future. It's the glorious future for God's people. And we'll discuss the truth of immortality through Christ and the cross. So immortality. So it's the, really it's the goal of every person, every religion, when you really get down to the nuts and bolts. Um, so the, the question is, how do you reach immortality? How do you get it? Are there lots of ways? Well, there's certainly lots of religions. But why do we as Christians say they, they, those religions fail to bring all immortality, but Jesus does? And we need to understand a bit more clearly in our day when we're bombarded with so many different ideas. Um, we've got the internet, we can see ideas all the time and on the news, everywhere. So the first part of my message today will be about how some non-Christian religions view immortality and, and the afterlife and that kind of thing. But before we get into that, I just want to clarify what we mean when we talk about immortality. Because there are a few different ways to use that word. Um, I think the NRL talk about the immortals in their, you know, so the ones whose names are famous supposedly forever because, because they're really good at playing rugby. Okay, that's one kind of immortality. But um, we're coming up to Anzac Day. You know, the phrase, less we forget. So we're trying to make sure we always remember these, these guys who who sacrificed for us. It's a bit closer to something worthwhile. Um, well, it's very worthwhile, but I'm talking in terms of what Jesus did on the cross, which is a whole different order of things altogether. But that's another kind of immortality, just being remembered. Your legacy and your achievements can outlive you and you can be remembered for a long time. But of course, when we say someone's immortal in that sense, it doesn't mean that that person didn't die, of course. Because... Literally, that's what immortal means. So im is not, and mortal means subject to death. So immortal means not subject to death. So now, I thought just, just for a bit of a laugh, I came across this during the week. I thought I'd put this in here. There's some people on the internet, a few websites, who seriously try and argue that some famous people are really immortal, or at least superhuman in some way. I'll just give you three examples. Some try and say that the rapper Jay-Z, he is immortal. See the picture there? That's from 1933. It's a guy that looks exactly like him. So some people say that's, that's actually him and he's just kept stayed alive and he doesn't age. So he lives forever and ever. And I also say this about John Travolta. So there's a picture from the 1860s. I'll try not to make you choke there, Cassandra, sorry. <laughs> and... Yeah, that, that guy obviously has very similar features to John Travolta, you can see there. So maybe he's immortal as well. And this is an, an intriguing one, this next one. Vladimir Putin. That's the Russian president. Uh, you have to say those first two photos look an awful lot like him, don't they? But he's definitely aged, if, if nothing else there. So, But it's, it's actually some who say he's a mythical creature who lives, has lived on Earth for centuries. And um, even though we know he was born on October 7th, 1952 in St. Petersburg in Russia. Or was he? Yeah. Now we know that that's where he was born. And anyway, I think all these claims prove is that everyone has a doppelganger out there somewhere in history. These people just happen to have theirs taken because they're, you know, people notice because they're famous. But it also shows, I think, that people have a deep longing for immortality. And that's probably partly because we're made in the image of an immortal God. So we have that longing for it. So th have this desire, along with people's fallenness, means that all kinds of religions and schemes have been developed to try and reach Im immortality without God. So today there's technology playing its part too. You know, there's cryogenics and all that. People try and freeze themselves so they can come back when the cure for their disease is found later on. But... What we're going to look at are things not to do with technology. We're just going to look at three non-Christian religions that, that have their own presuppositions and try and figure out what they are and see what their understanding of, of what happens when we die is. So we'll start with Islam, since it's in the news so much these days. 
So the word Islam, does anyone know what that actually means? There's probably a few here do. It means submission or surrender. And it's certainly the way the religion works. And it sort of clearly follows that idea that the only one, only the person who submits to Allah is approved. And let's be honest, it's a bit like Christianity, isn't it? It's, uh, we need to submit to God as well. That's what God asks us to do. In fact, they have their basic idea of being in, of, of a heaven being for the obedient and a hell for the disobedient is fairly close to Christian understanding. But some people confuse that as being the same. But the practical differences are very obvious. And I'll just point out two main ways that they're different. One is how you get to heaven and how you get immortality. In Islam, you get to heaven by pleasing Allah. But the question is, how do you please Allah? Now, that's a tricky question because Allah doesn't acknowledge that Jesus paid the price for everyone's sins. That means you have a situation where it depends entirely on the balance between his mercy or judgment in your particular case. And he can decide as he, as he wants to. So it's, it's a, he's unstable. So if you tip the balance in favour of his mercy, you go to heaven. But if not, you go to hell. So how do you tip the balance? Well, one way is to follow the rules of the Quran and what it teaches and ensure that others do as well. So you encourage others. Encourage in inverted commas. But if, uh, you know, if anyone refuses, you're quite within your rights to kill them, it says. And in fact, you're blessed if you do. And that, in fact, is another way to make it into Allah's good books and get to heaven to, to do that kind of thing. And that's why those Muslims who martyr themselves and, and take the infidel with them are honoured and in deeply Islamic countries and territories. So there's difference number one, certainly. Summarise that. It's fundamentally a works-based religion. And the works are considered good, that are considered good in Islam are often very different to what God, the true God, actually wants from us. Sometimes the same, but very often different. And those who do this kind of stuff, so that killing the infidel, they illustrate the second major difference between Islam and Christianity, in practical difference. And that's the motivation for what going to heaven is. For Christians, it is, or it should be, basically relational. To be with God and to love, love him, and because he loves us and he sacrificed himself for us. In Islam, they seek heaven for the rewards and pleasures that are promised, uh, and most of us know, heard about the 72 virgins that are awaiting the Muslim martyrs, don't we? You've heard that? Yeah. I guess that's only good for the men, though. Um, so the, the motivations are predominantly worldly and sensual, so, and, and, as I said, very biased in favour of the males. And it's the sacrifice that the person makes for God that's the measure of acceptance, not the other way around. So just to summarise, that's difference number two. The motivation is more for selfish pleasure, rather than to be with a loving God. But overall, Islam does not believe in... Uh, sorry, Islam does believe in immortality for everyone, either in heaven or hell. So you're, you, live, you go forever in one or the other. So that's Islam. Now, next we're going to look at Buddhism. And the goal of Buddhism is to reach nirvana. Does anyone know what nirvana is? Is there any description for that? No? Peace? Yeah? Kind of? Yeah. Well, yeah, we sort of, we get the impression that it's like, it's almost like heaven for, for Buddhists. So we sort of think it's a state of perfect bliss and happiness and, and kind of like our heaven. But it's actually not really. I was surprised to discover what the, the proper definition is. It's more accurately described as a cessation of all things. So they say nirvana is like a flame burning out. So it's the desires are what fuels that flame of your of your you know, your flame in your life, your earthly life. So when you reach that point when you have no desire, when that's when you're at complete Buddhist peace. But their peace describes more of an isolated lack of action, so you're by yourself kind of with nothing happening, rather than harmonious living with others. So in Nirvana you still exist. But there's no, as I say, there's no coming or going, no death or suffering or striving. So, okay, there's no bad, but there's also not really any good either. So when they, when they reach that state, they say, of having mastered all the desires, 
the good ones and the bad ones, then that flame is extinguished. So that means Buddhists practice getting into that state of being disconnected. So that's through meditation and, and disconnecting from reality and getting themselves into that sort of nothing place. Which is um, a lot like the meditation and, and the word often today is mindfulness techniques that are increasingly being promoted today through hospitals and schools as a means to get calm and promote healing in every part of you. And to, there's, to some degree they, they can work in you know, super, superficial sense. But as I understand it, it's really opening a door to evil spirits. It's dehumanizing and it shuts down the image of God in people because you're being isolated, you're being shut down to a nothing. So how does this compare to Christianity? Christianity says there's a wonderful, fulfilling future on offer if you believe in the name of Jesus, who will be the ruler of every aspect in that day. But the difference is that we're expected to participate in, in it and to work with God in bringing it about now as well. That's through faith, the whole thing. Through faith, the belief that he's working to that end and that he loves us and all those things and that he died on the cross and rose again. So in it, in that day, we'll have things to do, people to love, a God to serve, and we'll be living as God designed us to live, in a perfected place. Now that's a far cry from sort of this misty grey realm of nothingness and, and disconnect that Buddhists believe in. In fact, the description of nirvana actually reminds me of times when I've had a general anaesthetic or I've been unconscious for whatever reason, and, and you're sort of you're coming back out of it. I don't know if you've felt that. And you're trying to, your brain's trying to grab onto something to, to grab onto reality back, you know, back in the real world again. And I hate that feeling. So I'm not sure Buddhism's claims are all that appealing to me, to be honest. So to summarise, I, I believe their view of immortality is, is quite anemic. It's, it's a nothing, really. And they'll say it's nothing, of course. And finally, we'll just address Hinduism as well. Now, I'll let one who knows describe it. Um, you may have heard of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. You know that guy? He's famous as the guru for the Beatles and many others. And he says this, Once a man has become established in the understanding of the permanent reality of his life, or of life, his mind rises above the influence of pleasure and pain. Such an unshakable man passes beyond the influence of death and in the permanent phase of life, he attains eternal life. A man established in the understanding of the unlimited abundance of absolute existence is naturally free from existence of the relative order. This is what gives him status, the status of immortal life. So there we have the, the phrase absolute existence. So that's the goal and the definition of eternal life for Hindus. And you see, there, there are parts that are similar to Buddhism there, in, in the, that this present world is something to be risen above to be transcended and ultimately discarded. But that's not the way that Christianity understand, understands the coming new heavens and new earth. And you know, the important part there is the new earth. That's the part of Christianity that stands out. So for Hinduism and Buddhism, there are elements of Gnosticism in them because this physical world is unworthy of eternity. And in a sense, you know, that's true. That's why we need a new one. But they say it just gets discarded. But... As we say in the Bible, God still has a plan for it in a renewed state. So in Hinduism specifically, you get to transcend this world through repeated reincarnation. So if you're bad, you reincarnate down a rung or more in status and you're further from transcendence. But if you're good, you reincarnate to a better life. And that's why you have such a marked class structure in Hinduism. Have you heard of you know, the delete and all that? How they there's very much class structure in Hinduism, and it's it's a natural result of this hierarchical system, and the climbing up and down the ladder of status and honor. So, also inherent in this system is the idea of karma. So, that if you do bad, bad things come to you, and if you do good, good things come to you. Or as one quote I saw puts it, one becomes virtuous by virtuous actions, and bad by bad actions. So they say it's actions that determine your heart. So what's outside determines your heart. But God says it's your heart that determines your actions. So there's a difference there. So for the Buddhist, you have to... Sorry? 
Yeah, for the Buddhist, that's right, and I'm talking about the Buddhist there, to make sure I'm following this right. For the Buddhist, you have to keep doing good to keep progressing. So that's Hinduism, sorry, that's right, I made a mistake. So Hinduism, you keep progressing. And one of the good things you can do in Hinduism, like Buddhism, is to try and rise above, again, through meditation and yoga. Now, yoga is fundamentally Hindu, but has become a significant part of Buddhism as well, and you may have noticed it's getting fairly popular in Western culture too. But again, these practices are designed, I would argue, to take the, the participant into an altered, disconnected state which is not godly. God desires for us to become connected to him at all times, as Jesus was. Not having a mind open for wandering spirits to come in and make their home, which is a danger. But Hinduism is built on these things. And so they say if you keep on this true path and reincarnate better and better, eventually you get to the point where you're transcendent and you have immortality. As the Maharishi says, this quote was, free from the existence of the relative order, which is, I guess, what we are in now. But I don't know if you can you spot how this is really just a works-based religion again, isn't it? Because the power to supposedly, to supposedly become immortal is completely in your own hands. So as we look back then across these three religions, one main thing sticks out to me. And that's the fact that they have no saviour. There's no one in Islam, Buddhism or Hinduism who's promised to pull you up out of your mess. If you're in a mess, their gods will leave you there. So if you're drowning in life, who's there to pull you out? In all three, the saviour is who? Yourself. Yes. It's entirely up to you to do the right things and be self-disciplined and meditate and whatever and begin to move on the path to immortality. So the fact they have no actual saviour makes each religion, and I'm talking about all false religions here, not just these three, so it makes each false religion works-based. It's not about what's been done for you. It's about what you can do. Actually, actually no, it's about what you have to do. You have to do it to become immortal and transcendent. Okay, so what does the Bible say about immortality and how to get it then? So we've looked at the other things. Well, basically, it comes through the cross, which is our theme, obviously, for these three messages. And what, so one of the theme ideas through this message, and I've brought this image up every, every message so far, is the, the idea of going down to go up. So that's what the little yellow arrow there is talking about. A picture of the cross to go going down and then the resurrection at the end. So, now a lot of false religions have a semblance of this idea in them that you have to sacrifice or deprive yourself to progress, but they make that a imposition and a, and a and the, the main thing um, for you to do yourself. Uh, so, yeah, like I mentioned, there's some truth in that. I mean, that's that's the the fundamental way that we we grow, but. And any religion other than genuine Christianity misses the fact that the only sacrifice that matters has already been done by Jesus Christ. So the ultimate going down was done by and in God himself, Jesus the Messiah. And that means every person has the genuine offer of forgiveness and eternal life to go higher for eternity. But this higher is not, in the end, beyond this physical world. I mean, it has parts of that, of course. But as I said before, it will include a renewed physical world. But to be part of this renewed heaven and earth, we firstly have to entrust ourselves to the only way to get there. And the only way is Jesus. He's the way, isn't he? Because that's what he taught, John 14:6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now this statement is far too exclusive for Buddhism and Hinduism who are willing to accept all faiths as valid. And I read one quote that says, yeah, truth is one, paths are many. I think that was from one Hindu person who said that. And Jesus' statement is not acceptable to Muslims either because they say that Allah would never stoop to having a son, so therefore he can't be the only way. But as you look at Jesus' claim in the light of the, the go down to go up thing, picture there, to me it adds a new dimension to it. 
you go through Jesus, so we would, should expect to go through the low with him to get to the high. Because he sets the pattern for us to follow, as we saw last week. So we die with him. So the reason we die with him is so we will live with him and his eternal Holy Spirit in us. And his spirit is described as a deposit, um, guaranteeing our inheritance one day. That's the, the phrasing of the Bible. So when do we start to receive our inheritance? Well, that's why I'm going to finish off today by taking a bit of an overview of 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 58. Now it will be a brief flyover, but we'll pick a few things as we go through. Because I think that passage really describes the reason and the process behind our transition in resurrection through the rapture or through death. But I would argue that the rapture, the catching away of believers to heaven, is the end point of our death experience anyway. So I think they're closely related. And um, when I talked about the Jews going into the promised land across the Jordan, that kind of pictures it too. And so that event, so the, the rapture there, is the time when each person in the worldwide historical church receives his or her new immortal body. So let's read through how Paul describes this, starting from 1 Corinthians 1, 15 to 35. You can follow through as we go in your own Bibles. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person. I'll stop there. Now, because that's pretty harsh of Paul, isn't it? And in the Greek, that's, it is quite harsh. You fool, basically. But it's because the people who are asking this question were saying it in a mocking kind of way. Like, you know, whatever, as if, as if we, you could rise again. How can your dead body come back again if it's been decomposed or eaten by animals or whatever? That's just silly. What kind of body could you have if there's nothing left? That's, that's the kind of, I think, the attitude that he was addressing there. So Paul says they're foolish because examples of the principle of resurrection are all around. So he goes on. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that will be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. Grain. <clears throat> so the idea here is that the living seed gets buried and decomposes, but from that dry yellow single grain comes a rich green plant for harvest. That's completely different looking. And that's just like us. We're in a bare kernel, a body of a body at the moment, and bits are falling off and breaking and hurting for many of us. But we're destined for an upgrade in Christ. Yay. <laughs> so yeah, God has planned for us to go down before we go up. And so we're in this body for a reason. Verse 38. But God gives, us, gives it a body uh, as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same. There is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of stars, for star differs from star in glory. So basically Paul is saying that in our universe there's different orders of being, heavenly and earthly, and these correspond to the different orders in our natural bodies now and to our eternal bodies then. But he's also saying that within these two main orders of bodies, the earthly and the heavenly, there's also different levels of glory. So in the same way, there'll be different levels of glory for individuals in the coming age. Some people are a bit squeamish about saying that, but I think that's what this teaches and in many other places in the Bible. So this level of glory it will depend on what your inheritance will be. And if you've proven yourself worthy of leading or management or whatever task you're, you're good at. So Paul goes on, verse 42. So it is with the resurrection, sorry, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable, uh, what is sown is perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So whatever this life is preparing for us for, this shell of a natural body will, be, will have done its work and the new spiritual body, the one Paul calls our heavenly dwelling, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 2, that's when he uses that phrase, that's the one we'll put on. Now I don't feel I need to clarify something at this point, just about a spiritual body. When Paul talks about a spiritual body, 
He's not saying that this body is like a ghost. It's every bit physical and solid as this one is, only more so because it can last eternally. And of course, again, Jesus is the example there. We saw he was the example last week and he's the example in everything because he rose in his eternal body and we see that he ate food and he showed his disciples his, wound, his, disciples, his wounds and all kinds of things to prove he wasn't a ghost. As he said to his disciples in Luke 24:39, you don't need to turn there, I'll put it on the screen. It says, after his resurrection, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. But at the same time, he could appear in a room with all the doors shut and the windows shut, couldn't he? So assuming ours will be the same as his, our bodies, this resurrection body will be far beyond anything we've experienced. And I think it's reasonable to think that we'll have this sort of trans-dimensional, if you like, body, because if we jump down to verse 49, that's, 49 says this in 1 Corinthians 15, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, so that's Adam in the context there, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And um, there's other verses of the Bible talk about us um, seeing God as he is and, and, and being of the same kind, but we're not God's. Yes, the man of heaven is, of course, Jesus, so it will be in his likeness more than ever before. And why is this necessary? So why do we have to get this new body? Verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So that's right, our current bodies, which Paul simply calls flesh and blood there, that's what he means, they're not capable of living eternal life in the current form in case you haven't noticed and I'm talking to those probably over 35 here which is just about everyone here probably um, the idea that our bodies are perishable and starting to become more obvious well, that's starting to become more obvious to me now I'm nearly 41 which is still young I know but I, I do actually have to think before I do physical work and exercise now before I could just jump in and do it no warm up it was fine and I wouldn't hurt just keep going. But things change. We age a little. And of course, there, there are many here worse off than me. But for all of us, Paul has some good news. 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that's die physically, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. So this is a description of what we call the rapture, the snatching up of believers from the earth by Jesus. And of course there's much controversy about it, especially that there are always going to be conjectures about exactly when it's going to happen. Because I think it's pretty much every generation thought they'd be the one to experience the rapture. As you look back, the writings from all, the, all through history, and certainly our, no, our generation is no different. And there are many reasons to think it's very close. Um, I don't know, I just thought I'd chuck in here. Has anyone heard of the Revelation 12 sign that's doing the internet at the moment? There's a lot of people talking about that. No? Okay, that's fine. No, it's just Revelation 12 sign. Feel free to look it up. I, I, I don't think you can discount it, some of the theories around. There's um, theories about what it means for us, but have a look and I'll, we'll have a chat later. But our concern in this area is to watch and be ready. That's really the, the main point that Jesus always makes when he talks about this. Not so much to try and figure out the date. But I suspect God wants it somewhat, somewhat unpredictable as a means of keeping us sharp as Christians. I think that's a good reason for it. But when it does happen, the dead in Christ, so who are considered sleeping by Paul here, which is quite an appropriate description, I think, to, as far as God's concerned, he can just wake us up like that. You know? So it's like we're sleeping as far as he's concerned. But those dead believers will rise to life in their new eternal bodies. And those of us still living will be changed as well and, and joined to meet Jesus in the air. So we get that information from 1 Thessalonians 4. Now if you think about it, this just seems like complete fantasy, doesn't it? If you go and tell a person down the street that's what's going to happen, they'd laugh at you. It's a ridiculous idea, really. But I think that's why God made it so clear in Scripture, because it's absolutely going to happen one day. And it will shock the rest of the world. 
It might be sudden, but it won't be secret. There's a lot of people who accuse it of being a secret. I don't see it being a secret. It's going to be very well known when it happens because it will cause chaos, I'm sure. The government's trying to scramble for answers. I'm sure they'll be proposing aliens and all kinds of things. People will believe anything at that time, I think. But the point of it all is that this will be a time when we become immortal. This will, so we will have bodies that cannot die. Not just will not die, but cannot die. And this will be just the next step in the rolling back of the curse that this, our sin brought into the world. Jesus' victory will be being advanced further, as Paul says in verse 54. So let's look at this, verse 54. And 55, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It's a real challenge, isn't it? To death, just, hey death, you're done. And this is a victory in which all praise goes to God. Because do we, so what do we com- contribute to the whole thing? Nothing as far as this stuff is concerned, we simply believe. We believe that Jesus is capable of saving us as he promised, that he's the saviour and all the other, that all the other religions lack. And I remember looking at this, um, this little passage, these couple of verses. It was my, my first experience of this was when I was at my nan's funeral when I was 11. So this was, this was this, the bit of the service that really stuck out to me and I've just remembered it ever since when the, the preacher who's taking the service, he, he read this verse out, that death will be swallowed up in victory. Now, remember last time how we said that all the sins of the world were taken onto Jesus on the cross. That's really the picture here. Because Jesus died on the cross and took all the sin and death upon himself. And he, he, it's like he absorbed it, he took it into himself. And as I said before, it's kind of like Neo in the third Matrix movie, for those who've seen that. You know, in the end, he, he takes it all in on himself. I believe that's what they're probably trying to convey in that little part of the movie. Um, to defeat evil, the Saviour has to consume it in himself. So Jesus did at great personal cost. But because the cost was so great, the rewards are that much greater because you go down and you go up higher. So have you ever thought how great the end must be if the cost to achieve it is the death of God himself? And all the mess right through history. God's putting up with that. All the suffering and pain and so much of it that offends God in this world. He's willing to put up with that for the entire history of the world. And the only way we can explain that is to accept that the end must be so incredibly amazing and blessed. Both for God and for us who love him. But yes, in the meantime, death and sin are Satan's tools to enslave so much of the world. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. You see, that's, that's why other religions are so law-driven. So, you know, do this and do that to be saved. Because when you put the law or put the rules in place, all you do is provide a way for people to make their rebellion measurable. That's the purpose of the law. That's what the Bible says. You empower sin by putting a keep off the grass sign up, don't you? Put that there, that just gives sin an opportunity, doesn't it? If there's no sign there, then there's no temptation. But so, because we all sin, if we die while we're still holding on to it, it it has a sting. Sin has a sting. Death has a sting. It means eternal death because we've rejected Jesus' payment for it, if we hold on to it. But if we have accepted Jesus' forgiveness for our sin, then death has no sting. Death is actually a victory because we go to be with our Lord. And this is what Paul mentions as he finishes this section, so verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's also a victory in the present because we now have a hope of overcoming sin. So point that out. Verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. So that's the final encouragement in all this. Be steadfast, immovable. So hang in there, basically, that's the idea. He says to keep at the work God has given and to keep 
increasing it more and more. And how can we do that? What's the motivation? Well, it's because our work is not in vain. It's not for nothing. It is all worth it in the end. That's really what he's getting at here. The going down in the difficulties of this life are more than offset by the greatness of being with God forever. So as we wrap up this series on the cross, let's keep in mind that all these blessings are available to us through faith because of Jesus' willingness to die for each one of us on that cross. So we should always live in thankfulness of of that cross for the cross and what what Jesus did for us. So let's pray. Well, we are so thankful, Lord. We remind ourselves every week at communion. Help us to remind ourselves daily, Lord, in our own times with you that what you did is an amazing thing. You gave up so much because you love us. And we thank you. Help your love to flow through us to other people too. And as we look forward, Lord, to the day that we can be with you in person in new bodies, Lord, we thank you for that great hope, that blessed hope, and we um, praise you for it. So we pray.